Welcome, friends, to worship here at Gates Presbyterian Church. I want especially to offer a warm welcome to my friend and colleague, JD, who is here from Trinity Emmanuel. And we have prepared this service for you um, for Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday as a joint effort. So welcome to this virtual space. Uh, we invite you just to come into this place with us where God is centered already and waiting for our presence. And thank you for allowing us to come and join you, uh, Laura. And uh, we invite you all to partake in this as we partake together in this Holy Week uh, celebration. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. We ask you, sisters and brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Does God expect me to be kind and loving to those who use my labor to build up their wealth and prosperity? The sweat from my brow and the calluses on my hands allow my master to live in great luxury while I struggle to provide food enough for my children. If we are God's chosen people, as the ancient texts tell us, why are we kept in such a lowly state? And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil. Likewise, you who are younger, 
be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Then, then why does God allow our rulers to profess to embrace the same faith and teaching as we do? Why are they allowed to be selfish and cruel in their actions? And does God not see the chief priests of God's temple dress themselves in luxurious raiment and profit by appropriating the meager tithes of the poor and destitute? How is this conduct practicing humility? If God opposes the proud, why does God not punish those who are arrogant and care only about themselves? Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice and judge not and you not be judged. For with judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will measure you. But does God not understand that we are judged every day of our lives? By our clothes, we are judged to be poor. By our speech, we are judged to be ignorant. By the color of our skin, we are judged to be inferior. By the way we are subjugated by our rulers, we are judged to be expendable. To cast off our bitterness and anger is not an easy thing to do. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let us be very ever mindful that whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the teachings of the prophets. Do, do nothing, nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. Thanks be to God.
Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, in whose house the scribes and the elders had gathered. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. But they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. The high priest stood up and said, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But Jesus was silent. Then the high priest said to him, I put you under oath before the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Hear the word, justice, the maintenance or administration of what is just, acting or being in conformity with what is morally upright or good, the quality of being just, impartial or fair, conformity to truth, fact or reason. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Hear the word, freedom, the quality or state of being free, the absence of necessity, corrosion, or constraint in choice or action, liberation from slavery or restraint or from the power of another, the quality of being frank, open, or outspoken, the positive enjoyment of various social, political, or economic rights and privileges. Pilate then called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people, and said to them, you brought me this man as one who is perverting the people. And here I have examined him in your presence and have not found this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. Indeed, he has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Then they all shouted out together, Away with this fellow! Release Barabbas for us! This was a man who had been put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will therefore have him flogged and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate gave his verdict that their demand should be granted. He released the man they asked for, and the one who had been put in prison for insurrection and murder, and he handed Jesus over as they had wished. Hear the word, 
hope, to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or be true, to expect with confidence, to be expectant, usually involving the idea of prepar preparing or envisioning. Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Hear the word, sacrifice, to suffer loss of, give up, renounce, injure, or destroy, especially for an ideal belief or end, an act of offering something precious to a deity, destruction or surrender of something for the sake of something or someone else. Never said among the 
What does God expect of us? Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to his life as a ransom for many. God expects us to be good servants. What does God expect of us? Heal the stick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. God, God expects, expects us to be generous givers. What does God expect of us? For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that where, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. God expects us to encourage and support others. What does God expect of us? For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. God expects us to be forgiving. What does God expect of us? I will teach you the way that is good and right. Be sure to respect and honor the Lord and serve faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things God has done for you. God expects us to be faithful. We pray for the strength and the courage to do all that God expects of us. My warnings were ignored. My predictions of repression and danger were discounted. My rabbi's subversive behavior has put us all at great risk. Risk of losing our freedom. Risk of losing our lives. Jesus' ministry began with his teachings to the faithful that we must love and care for each other. His words did not threaten anyone. But then the healing started, and the stories of his miracles spread through the towns and villages like fire through the dry grasslands. And before we understood what was happening, multitudes of people were pressing in on Jesus, begging for healing, asking for good fortune, pleading to bring their dead children back to the living. This procession of strangers seeking miracles had no beginning or end. Who were these people? And did they deserve Jesus' attention? Why should our rabbi show favor to a man who oppresses our people by collecting taxes for the benefit of the Roman occupiers? Why should Jesus restore the sight of a sinner who is a Gentile? As if it were not enough to have the life crushed from us from these waves of people seeking a miracle from Jesus, we must be fearful of the hatred and vengeance being plotted by the temple elders. Why must Jesus continue to challenge the council of the Sanhedrin? What is to be gained by questioning the teachings of the priests? If Jesus is truly the Son of God, why then does God not counsel him to be respectful of those who have been anointed to lead the Messiah, who will free us from the bondage? But Jesus has no army to defeat the Romans. Instead, he preaches against the council, against his own kind. 
Jesus' grace and his miracles should, should be bestowed on those of our faith. We have no time to care for the non-believers, and we have no forgiveness for those who sin against God's commandments and who blaspheme. Jesus has lost his way. Life has taught me that the poor, the lame, and the destitute will always be with us. Care and comfort should be given to our own kind. We are God's chosen people. The disciples that our teacher Jesus has called to follow him are walking on the path of righteousness. But it is true that at times they've lost their way and strayed from that path. I was witness to the time when the children of a small village near the city of Joppa, seeing Jesus approaching, ran to him to touch him and to sit at his feet to hear his teachings. It was Jesus' disciples who rebuked the children and kept them apart from our rabbi. Are these men so hard-headed and cynical from age that they have forgotten that they were at one time children with an innocent desire to learn and a purity of heart to clearly hear the word of God? Time and again, Jesus has taught us by his actions that all are welcome in God's kingdom and that the least among us shall be first to receive God's grace. Was it not Jesus who befriended the tax collector whose name is Zacchaeus? Again, the disciples scolded our teacher for embracing and sharing a meal with this man who was a traitor to our people and a friend to the Romans. And yet again, the disciples were angered and confused that Jesus would defend an adulterer who made no defense for her sin. Why would he seek to put himself between the sinner and the crowd that was intent on punishing her? The lesson that Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, trying to teach all of us, is that sins can be forgiven if we set aside our sinful ways and try to follow God's commandments. Each day is a new beginning that encourages us to reach for God's love and live in God's grace. Jesus has the wisdom to know and the compassion to understand that sometimes we will fail. But if we never turn away from God's path, then there will always be hope. Life has taught me that embracing those people that most members of our faith have shunned and cast out will always be difficult. But the road to God and to the kingdom of peace and salvation is not always smooth and level. The journey can be fraught with dangers, toils, and snares. But I know in my heart that God's grace will see me through to the end of my journey. Hear the word, empathy, the action of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings, thoughts, and experience of another, characterized by or tending to broad humanistic culture, demonstrating unity or harmony in action or effect. I pray to God three times a day as the ancient teachings command us to do. As a holy man, it is my obligation to inform God of the misdeeds and the sins of those who pray in the temple. Each day I give thanks to God that I am not like these wicked people, these robbers, these adulterers, and these evildoers who falsely claim that they love and obey the Lord our God. I am truly blessed to be installed as the high priest of the temple in the city of Ephraim. But allowing these unholy people to pray in the temple is a shameful allowance that plagues all the most holy sites in Judea. It is a simple thing to determine who among those in prayer are unclean and should not be allowed to enter the temple. To the trained eye, these people are all the same in appearance and manner. Their skin is dark and their speaking sounds strange. Their lineage can be drawn to the regions of Barawa and Safala, in other cities where God's rules and teachings are either unknown or disobeyed. Though people of these regions live in houses made from reeds that grow in the shallows, they eat what they can from forged from the wilderness. They have no moral code, and they worship pagan gods 
with strange and perverted rituals. The truth is that since the past generations of these sinful people were pagan worshipers and led an unclean life, then as descendants, these people should be cast out of the temple and allowed never to return. Life has taught me that God shows favor to those who are pure in their lineage and righteous in their judgment of others. Woe be to those who are impure, for swift and terrible will be God's punishment. I am truly ashamed of my sins against God. I know in my heart that I have strayed and have broken God's sacred commandments. At times I find myself thinking that perhaps the gods that the Romans pray to are more powerful than the God of Abraham. If our God is the one true and glorious God, then why are the Romans allowed to occupy our lands and oppress our people? I struggle each day to keep my faith in our God. I know that my service to the Roman authorities has branded my family and me as traitors and outcasts. I can do very little to prove to those who share my religion that I am not guilty of any of those offenses. And while it is true that my lineage began in the region of Kilwa, my father and his father before him and his father before him were all brought into this world in the province of Judea. As all can plainly see, my skin shows more of the color of the night skin than it does the color of the sky day. But the teachings of this man Jesus cast aside the custom of contempt and judgment of those who are not of your family, not of your city, not of your faith, and not proclaimed as holy in the eyes of God. I know that I should be in prayer three times from the sunrise to the sunset, but I have many responsibilities that must be fulfilled each day before the lamp is put out so that rest may come to me. But this man, Jesus, has preached that what you pray for is of far more importance than the number of times you pray each day. I believe that God knows all my virtues and all my sins. I do not dwell on the virtues, for they are few in number. Jesus teaches that a repentant heart is a joy to God. To loathe a group of people for how they speak, or to look down upon them for the darkness of their skin, or to cast out people for their transgressions is not the way of the Lord. Life has taught me that everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Hear the word, benevolence, a disposition to do good, an act of kindness, disposition to or an act or instance of kindness, courtesy, or claimancy, compassion, treatment, or those of those in distress, the quality or state of being kind. Never have I had to endure living in such a wretched and repulsive land as this provincial scourge called Judea. If Epictus is seeking a muse for a poem about the vile underworld, realm of Hades, then he need look no further than this accursed city of Jerusalem. The filth in the streets is surpassed only by the ignorance of the people. The people of this land make no statues of their God. Their sacrifices to this one God are pitiful, and their reward for their faith and loyalty is to be to servitude to a power far greater than their God, the Roman Empire. The power and strength of Rome is beyond the ability of words to describe it. Our exalted Emperor Augustus Caesar has said that if all the soldiers in our legions were commanded to raise their shields at the same time, it would hide the sunlight over all the world. Yet some of these Judeans still question the authority of Rome. Try as they might, I cannot understand why any person would defy Rome's authority and object to swearing their obedience to the Empire and to Augustus. The prisons are filled with those who would speak out against our rule. Those who seek to drive out old soldiers and rise up in rebellion will find themselves nailed to one of the hundreds of crosses that pierce the hail sides for, for as far as the eye can see. We are not bound to afford justice to these people. Citizens of Rome can push for their grievances to be heard 
or for an offense to be tried. But these people have no such rights. They should be forever grateful that our merciful empire, emperor, allows them to live and to go about their lowly work. Life has taught me that strength and power are tools to be used to keep those who seek change to the order from the successful in that goal. For to those who wield the sharpest sword and who let the, the swiftest arrow falls the right to the decree, the rules, and make your vanquished enemies your dishonored servants. Okay. From the time that I came of age, I have passed more time in Roman prisons than I have in walking the streets as a free man. And now I find myself yet again in this familiar place, knowing that I have brought disgrace to my father and have caused nothing but pain and anguish to my mother. While it may be cruel to say, it is probably for the best that they have been dead for many seasons. On the day that God will call me to account for my life and weigh out the, my deeds, separating the good from the bad as the farmer threshes the harvest, I fear that there will be a mountain of shaft, but a handful of wheat. I make no excuses for my conduct. I have robbed because I was hungry and have fought because I was angry. I have forged and I have faked. I have lied because I have lusted for money and was not willing to work to earn it. I am not proud of what I have done. If it were in my power to change my past, I would certainly do so. With, my, with age comes wisdom and regret even when your youth was poorly, poorly lived and you choose sin as your companion. I may be beyond redemption, but the consequences I have endured and the punishments I have served were just and desired. But from the talk that I have heard from the soldiers who guard my cell, this rabbi from Nazareth has committed no offense. It is an evil authority that seeks to crush those who seek justice by accusing them of offenses that they did not commit to punish and imprison those who seek to change the unjust laws put forth by those in power for the purpose of silencing the voices of fairness and reason. It is a fair, far greater offense than any I have committed. Life has taught me that what God requires of us is not to pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge all people fairly, for no one stands above the laws and commandments of God. Justice is to be blind to all things and consider only that which is the truth. Hear the word, faith. Believe in the traditional doctrines of a religion firm belief in something for which there is no proof, complete trust, fidelity to one's promises, sincerity of intentions, belief and trust in and loyalty to God.
It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly, this man was innocent. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. <clears throat> 